Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In today's video, we're gonna take a look at what's called the Paul Merriman Ultimate Buy and Hold Portfolio. A number of folks have asked me to take a look at this in the comments to past videos. And it turns out that Paul is a good friend of mine. I'm, I've known Paul well, for a number of years. He was on my podcast a number of years ago. In fact, we were just chatting about a month or so ago. And uh, he has a great portfolio. And I'm kind of excited to share it with you. And one of the things I like about these videos, both whether we're evaluating sort of a professional's portfolio, like we are today, or one of the portfolios that you send in. And if you want to do that, just leave a comment to this video with the ticker symbols and the percent you have allocated to each. I got a lot of them already, but I am going to be working through them. The thing I like about doing this is it's not really just about the portfolio. We can learn a lot about individual funds, whether they're ETFs or mutual funds, how to evaluate them, uh, tools that we can use to evaluate investments as well as our portfolio as a whole. And the nice thing for me is, as I'm putting these videos together and preparing for them, I learned something uh, as well, and today is no different. All right, as I like to say, enough chit chat, let's get to uh, the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. And first, you might say, well, you know, who the heck is Paul Merriman? Well, there he is. He's, uh, I think Paul would not mind if I said, like me, he's an old guy. And uh, he has uh, been in the business for a very long time. You can see here, he actually started a wealth management firm back in the 80s. He's since, I'll call it quote unquote retired. He's about the least retired person that I know. Uh, incredibly busy, started as you can see there, a 501c3, uh, sort of a, an, an educational foundation, if you will, to help educate people about investing. And one of the reasons I like Paul so much and think he's a really, really smart guy is because he and I think alike. <laughs> he's a big believer in low-cost index funds, and he writes for Market Watch. And uh, so what we're going to look at today is, again, the, the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. Before we get to it, just one thing to make clear. What we're going to look at today is kind of what I consider the sort of core foundational Paul Merriman ultimate buy and hold portfolio. But there are variations of it. Some are minor variations. Some are major variations of it. And in fact, we'll look at some variations today. But our main focus is going to be on sort of the core ultimate buy and hold portfolio, which consists of 10 stock asset classes. Now, that may seem like a lot. We haven't even gotten to bonds yet. We've already got 10 asset classes for the stocks. And frankly, it is a lot. Uh, if you're in M1 Finance, and I'm going to show it to you in M1 Finance. It's easy to manage. If you're at a broker, then, you know, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, there's a little sort of work to be done when you're going to rebalance. Uh, but as you'll see, it has an incredible historical performance. So uh, let's take a look at it. Let's go back to the monitor. And we will come over to here so I can make this a little bigger. And don't, don't let your eyes glaze over when you see this. It's actually not that complicated to follow. And what I want to do is I want to start down here in the bottom where it says ultimate buy and hold equity portfolio asset class allocation. And you can see here, he actually has seven portfolios. And next to number seven down here uh, is UBNH. That's ultimate buy and hold. So let's first walk through the asset classes. There are 10 of them. We'll just start here at the S&P 500 and move to the right. So obviously the S&P 500 would be a fund that tracks uh, in the S&P 500, you know, the 500 of the largest US companies. And then we can just, once you know the abbreviations, these are really easy to follow. This is simply U.S. large cap value. So a value uh, a fund. Keep in mind, value would be stocks uh, where, that, are, that are sort of reasonably priced or maybe even undervalued when measured against the company's earnings, say in a P.E. ratio or perhaps in the company's uh, uh, net worth. So you like a price to book or price to net worth. So these would be value. So think... Today, Bank of America is a value company. Uh, as compared to, say, Tesla or Amazon, those are growth companies. So they're expensive on a PE basis, but they're, in theory, growing rapidly. So the second uh, asset class, U.S. large cap value. Uh, the third one is U.S. large cap, and the B stands for blend. So that would be a blend of, um, and, and excuse me, I said large cap. S is small cap. U.S. small cap blend. So that would be a blend of both value and growth. And to help put that in some context, the S&P 500 is a blend. It's, it's got growth companies and it's got value companies. So uh, this would be the same kind of thing, but focused on small caps. 
And then we have U.S. small cap value. Then we have a REIT, real estate investment trust. And then he has international large cap blend. So you could think of it similar to an S&P 500, but for companies headquartered outside of the U.S. And then we have international large cap value, international small cap blend, international small cap value, and then emerging markets. Now, those are the asset classes. One thing I'll say is I'm going to leave in the very first comment below this video a link to an article I'm going to publish on my site, robberger.com, that sort of lays all this out and hopefully easy to, to follow um, uh, lists and bullet points and, I don't know, pretty pictures, whatever, all that stuff. I will also, though, link to all of the things I'm showing you, including this page from Paul's site. I'll link to it below the video and I'll link to it in my article on robberger.com. So you'll have it all. All right. Now, what he started to do was build out portfolios. And he started with number one, just simple S&P 500, 100%. And then he added some large cap value. And then he added some small cap blend and so on, all the way down until he gets to what he calls the ultimate buy and hold. And you can see it's 10% in each of the 10 asset classes. And keep in mind, we're only talking about the stock portion of the portfolio, that we're not talking about bonds at this point. And he did that so that when we come up here and we look at performance, he can compare how each of these hypothetical portfolios performed. And you notice he looks at data from 1970 to 2020. So that's 51 years of data. And this first sort of uh, series rebalances the portfolio annually. You see that there. This one is identical, except it rebalances monthly. So let's start with the annual. And we can see portfolio one. Again, that's just 100% S&P 500. He assumes that there's an initial $100,000 investment and it would grow to about $18 million. You can see it would have an annualized compound return of 10.7, standard deviation of 16.9. And if you, if you don't love statistics, just keep this in mind. The higher that number, the more volatile the portfolio is, the more fluctuation it has in prices. And we just kind of go, here's portfolio two, which maps to the second row down here, and three and four, all the way up to the buy and hold. And we can see, if we look at the returns, they pretty much go up with each portfolio. You add, um, in addition to the S&P 500, some large cap value, it goes from 10.7% return to 10.9. You add some small cap blend, it jumps to 11. Small cap value, 11.4, all the way up to his ultimate buy and hold, 12.4%. And you can see the difference is amazing as compared to the S&P 500. That was at 18 million. And this one more than doubled that to 38 million. And I know those numbers, you look at this and you say, well, Rob, wait a minute, this is 10.7. This is 12.4. I think we can all agree that 12.4 is more than 10.7. But you say, come on, that adds $20 million? Well, it does when you invest over a 51 year period, that is the magic of compounding. Now, one thing I wanna point out about this portfolio, look at the standard deviation, it's 18.5. We come back to the S&P 500, it was 16.9. And that's not insignificant. The portfolio that Paul is laying out here is pretty volatile. I mean, it's not crazy volatile, but you know, there's gonna be some ups and downs. Now note too, right down here, he says the returns have been reduced by the equivalent of a representative fund's expense ratio. So he's, he's factored in expenses and there's the data. If you go to monthly rebalancing, it's interesting, the numbers come down, uh, but if you look at the portfolio seven, you know, it goes from 12.4 uh, to an average of 12.1% on the return. But look at the uh, standard deviation, it drops from 8.5 to 7.4, that's pretty significant as well. Personally, for me, I kind of like annual rebalancing uh, just because it's easy. <laughs> of course, if you use M1 Finance, I suppose you can rebalance pretty much anytime you want, particularly if you're in a tax deferred account and you don't have to worry about taxes. So that is his portfolio. Now, what I want to do is look at it in, um, uh, I think first we'll look at it in M1 Finance. So let's go back to the screen. I have created this, again, I'll link to it. Merriment, Ultimate, Buy and Hold. And what I've created is an 80-20 portfolio. So what I've done is I've taken the, the 10 asset classes that we just looked at, and I've mapped them to 10 stock ETFs, and they're the ones that have 8%. And 
And the reason it's 8% is because I'm, this is, like I said, this is a 80-20 portfolio. So 20% has to go to bonds. So we can just see that we got the international small cap value. This is international uh, large cap value. This is um, uh, small cap uh, international. And then all the Vanguard funds, you know, emerging markets, real estate. Here's the S&P, S&P value, and so on. And then for the bonds, what I've done is uh, I've got 10% to tips. They're short-term tips and 10% to treasuries. And by doing that, I'm basically... Um, not making a wager on inflation. If inflation t ends up being higher than we expected, the tips pay off. If it turns out to be lower uh, than expected, the treasuries pay off. It's kind of like heads, you know, we win, tails, they lose. I'm not sure who the they is, but it's kind of a way not to place a bet on future inflation. Now, a couple of really important things. One is this is really for a tax advantaged or tax deferred account, an IRA. If you wanted to hold something like this in a taxable account, I personally would make a couple of changes. Well, I'd make one for sure. I get rid of the REIT right here. REITs are highly tax inefficient, and it's because REITs aren't taxed at the corporate level, but to get that advantage, you know, the government wants their money. So if the, if the REIT's not gonna pay the taxes, the government wants us to pay the taxes. And so they force REITs effectively to pay at least 90% of their income out in the form of dividends to us, and they're often typically taxed as ordinary income. So like a double whammy. And so you really don't want to hold REITs in a taxable account. That's the one change I'd absolutely make. In terms of the bonds, you, there's a, a lot of different ways you could play the bonds. You could have just one fund, total bond fund, 20%. Some in a taxable account, if you're at a high tax bracket, you might, you might use munis, municipal uh, bond funds. That's certainly an option. Uh, I'm not as concerned today about holding bond funds in a taxable account because unfortunately they're not paying anything. <laughs> they're not producing enough yield to actually generate any taxable income. Frankly, I wish I had more, more bonds in my tax, taxable account. So that's how I've set it up. I'll leave a link to, the, to this portfolio. You can either add it to your M1 uh, account and then make whatever changes you want. Or if you invest somewhere else, you can still get access to this and check it out. And um, so this is 80-20. Obviously, if you wanted to make it say 70-30, you could change your bonds to total 30% and change all of these allocations down to seven. Um, so there's a lot of different ways uh, you can change this. You almost, I almost see, uh, I almost look at, at Paul's buy and hold portfolio as sort of a Lego set. You got all these cool Legos in the form of asset classes. These asset classes can get mapped not just to the ETFs I've shown you, but to countless others. So you can sort of pick and choose. In terms of the 10 asset class ultimate buy and hold, it's almost like he's given us a picture of what we can make with our Legos if we want to. And that's basically what I've done here in M1 Finance. I've made a pretty dinosaur in Legos or whatever you want to call it. Um, so there you go. Now, uh, I want to jump back briefly to uh, this chart. Remember we looked at the returns. They averaged 12.4 if you rebalanced annually, 12.1 if you rebalanced um uh, monthly. This was over a 51-year period, and that raises the question, well, how have they done recently? So I actually put the portfolio in Portfolio Visualizer. Now, something about you need to know about this. The data is limited based on which funds are in here. And so one of the things that I'm able to do, because I pay for this tool, is map some of these funds to asset classes that tells Portfolio Visualizer, hey, if you don't have a lot of data on that particular fund, use the data you have for the asset class that fund covers. And it helps a little bit, it still doesn't give us a ton of data. But in this case, what it did, actually it gave us data, well, this says from January 2020 to 21, which is wrong. Let's see if I've got that fixed. Okay, I got it fixed. Problem was I wasn't signed in and I had to change one of the funds. All right, so when we analyze this portfolio, we're able to go back, as you can see here, to January of 2010, so it's not a whole lot of data, but I thought it's, it's actually an interesting time period because as we know, growth funds outperformed value funds over the last decade and large cap really crushed it. And that's a problem for the Paul Merriman buy and hold portfolio because it's heavily weighted, uh, tilted towards value and small companies. It's also tilted towards international and US uh, stocks have outperformed international as well. And so when we look at the portfolio, here it is, there's a pretty chart. We go down to the growth, we can see it's got a compound annual growth rate of 9.95%, uh, certainly not bad. Standard deviation of 15, that's not terrible. Sharp ratio though is pretty low, 
Um, and we wonder why. And the answer can be found, I think, is if we go to VU, which is Vanguard to S&P 500, and we can put 100% in, we can now compare the Paul Merriman buy and hold to uh, S&P 500 over the last 10 or 11 years. And when we do that, we see that the S&P 500 here really kind of crushed the Paul Merriman buy and hold portfolio. It returned 14.6%. Paul's still there under 10%. It's got a higher Sharp uh, ratio and a higher Sortino ratio, which if those are new to you, they basically tell you how the portfolio performs in relation to the amount of risk you're taking on, risk being defined by standard deviation. And the problem you can see here, um, it, it, the standard deviation for the S&P for, for um, 500 is actually lower than Paul's. Now, what do we take from that? The real question is, why is this happening over the last 10 years? And again, I think it's the answer that we've, we've had um, easy money policies, we've had low interest rates, uh, both of those have gotten even more uh, extreme in, since COVID. And I think it explains everything from a Kathy Wood ARK fund that returns 150% in one year to Bitcoin going from five grand to 60 grand back to what, 32,000, now back to 40. Um, people like to tell themselves a story about the asset uh, and, and use that to explain its performance. Sometimes that's true. Uh, but I think for a lot of assets, including, I'll, I'll be the first to admit it, some that I'm invested in, have done well because of monetary policy. Uh, so I, the point, though, that I'm making is I don't care what your portfolio is, uh, unless it's just basically the S&P 500. Over even a decade, it can significantly underperform other portfolios, other benchmarks. That's just the way it is. That's life. You have to kind of get used to that. You need to have confidence in the approach you're taking and stick with it. If you did that in the case of the Paul Marion buy and hold portfolio over the last 51 years, you did extremely well. Uh, but you have to live through periods like, well, the last 10 years where you were underperforming and you had a slightly more volatile portfolio. So you have to keep those things in mind. That's not specific though to Paul's portfolio. I think it's true of any portfolio uh, that we use. A three fund portfolio sometimes going to really underperform other portfolios. You're going to have to listen to people at work talk about ARK or their Bitcoin portfolio or, you know, making money in GameStop. I don't know, whatever. There's always going to be someone or some fund or some port portfolio uh, that's outperforming, you know, particularly in a short time period. And that's true here as well. And I wanted to show you that. Now, um, I want to look at his portfolio now in personal capital. And I've put it in here. You can see it's right here. And I made it a million dollar portfolio because who, who doesn't like a million bucks? Just came in just a little under. And I want to look at the allocation because there's when we look at this, you, we're going to see a problem. Um, so the first is it looks like, um, uh, oh, hang on for a second. I got to make sure I exclude all the other uh, accounts. Here we go. I knew something didn't look right. All right, that's a, a little better. You'll notice that it looks like international stocks have more than US stocks. Well. It's because these alternatives over here are U.S. as well, but they're just classified as alternatives. But what I want to focus on are the U.S. stocks. Now, remember two things. His, his portfolio is tilted towards small cap and value. Well, when we look at large cap, we, we can see the tilt. See over here, this right here is large cap. It's 5%. And we come over here to the growth, and it's 3%. So, yep, large cap, fair enough, tilted towards value. We can see the same thing at mid cap. The growth is 1.9%. We come over here to value, it's uh, 5%. So big tilt towards value. And sure enough, small cap value 4%, small cap growth here 1.5%. But here's what I want to show you. If we think about this for a minute, remember it's uh, 10 asset classes, uh, each with 10%, because I, I didn't include the bonds in this. So this is 10% uh, each. Uh, and so We've got small cap, that's one asset class. We've got small cap value, that's a second. If they each get 10% on a million dollar portfolio, that's you know 200 grand. Pretty simple, right? But when you look at these values, small cap value is 40,000, small cap core is 43, small cap growth is 14, almost 15. Now, I was not a math major, I majored in English, but I'm pretty sure that doesn't add up to 200 grand. And the question is, what gives? Well, uh, this is, I think, really important to understand. For our small cap, we can come over here to holdings. We have uh, VB, small cap uh, index, and then we have the small cap value. 
uh, fund, which is right here. Um, and you can see they both have 100,000, right? So where'd our, where'd our 200 grand go? Well, let's look at VB for a second. I'm gonna pop over here to uh, Morningstar. I've already pulled it up. Here it is, VB, five-star fund. We can see here US small uh, fund, small blend. I mean, everything looks good, right? What's the problem? Well, let's go to portfolio. When we go to portfolio, we see our, our, our style box. Let me see if I can make this a little bigger for you. I'm trying to make it a lot bigger. There we go. Hope you can see that. Uh, remember, we got these nine grids here, and, and this row is large cap, mid cap, and small cap, and the blue is this fund, and it's yeah, it's in the small cap, but just barely. If you were playing tic-tac-toe, you'd say to your opponent, where did you mean to put that X? Which, which square did you put it in? Um, and uh, in fact, uh, if we go to market cap here, we can see that the market cap, average market cap of this fund is $6 billion. Well, that seems awfully big for a small cap, but again, you know, there are $100 billion companies, trillion dollar companies. So in the world of public companies, $6 billion is kind of small. But check this out. We can click here to wait right there. And look at all this in the mid cap. What's going on there? Well, a couple of things here. First of all, there's no one definition of small cap. This, you know, uh, Morningstar has its own definition. Vanguard, Vanguard could define it differently. Maybe Paul Merriman defines it differently. But the, the thing to keep in mind is just because a fund says it's a small cap doesn't mean that it's 100% small cap or that Morningstar, how it will view it. Now, Morningstar does classify this as a small cap company or a fund, but in truth, it's barely small cap. It, it's really like small slash medium. Now, for me, if I were going to implement this portfolio, I would be perfectly fine with that. But some folks would say, no, 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 no. If, I, if I'm going to have small cap, by golly, I want small cap. Well. So what I did, I did a search for what are called micro cap. And I found one here on Investopedia, IWC. Never heard of IWC. Uh, I'm going to pull it up here. There it is. And we're going to go to portfolio. By the way, it's 60 basis points. So it's kind of, yeah, not, it's expensive by Vanguard standards. I'll, I'll put, put it that way. Look at this. It, it, it's so small cap, it doesn't even make... This is like playing tic-tac-toe and, and your opponent didn't even put the circle inside any of the nine boxes. <laughs> That's how small cap this is. Now, if we go to market cap, remember the other fund was six billion. This is under one billion. So this is, this is truly small companies as it relates to, to you know, public firms. Now, if we uh, come back up here to wait, we can see, look, just 2% uh, categorizes as mid cap according to Morningstar. The rest is small cap. So again, I, I, I would be perfectly fine with the Vanguard fund, but you may not be. And so you have to remember, if we go back to this portfolio, you can add this portfolio to your M1 finance account and then make whatever changes you want. You can rip out the Vanguard small cap fund. And if you think uh, this is a good fund, put this one in instead or research and find other uh, micro cap funds. The other thing to keep in mind is the same thing applies not just with the size of the companies, but with where they are on the value versus growth spectrum. So you can have a fund that's way over here on the line of value and another fund that's more like right here, close to the blend. They're both technically value companies, but they have, can have very different uh, portfolios. So that is something that you want to keep in mind. So. There you go. There is the uh, Paul Merriman Ultimate Buy and Hold 10 Asset uh, Equity Asset Class you know, Buy and Hold Portfolio, uh, incredibly well diversified, an incredible uh, track record over the last 50 years. What the next 50 years will, will hold? No idea. I do know that it's fallen behind over the last 10 years. Uh, that personally wouldn't concern me because I don't think where we are is permanent. I think these are cycles that we, we go through. I don't personally invest in the 10 fund portfolio. I certainly own some funds uh, that would, would make their way into Paul's portfolio. I'm a big believer in having small cap exposure. I'm a big believer in having emerging market exposure. I have both. And I like to generally tilt my portfolio towards value. I sometimes tend to do that through investing in individual stocks. Uh, but at times I haven't. I've invested, I remember a Bridgeway fund, I think it was called. It was a micro cap that I owned like 20 years ago. So certainly done those sorts of things in the past. Anyway, I love the Paul Merriman portfolio. I think it's a great learning tool and I think it's a great way, you know, I think it's a reasonable way to invest if you want to go that way. 
or just use it as a starting point to build a portfolio that you're comfortable with. As always, remember, uh, this channel is for education and occasionally entertainment, but I try to keep that to a minimum. It's not really hard, is it? Anyway, um, you know, I'm not your financial advisor, so if you want professional advice, you need to seek out a professional investment advisor uh, to get advice. Uh, I'm here to just share my thoughts, uh, in this case, on the Paul Merriman Ultimate Buy and Hold portfolio. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to help you out. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.